Why should you look beyond Eurocentric wine and food pairings? What's so special about vineyard-designated wines? And how can you get the most out of your next trip to Sonoma County? In today's episode, you'll hear the stories and tips that answer those questions in our chat with superstar winemaker, Teresa Heredia, who has worked for some of California's most prestigious wineries. Now, this is part two of our conversation, but if you missed the first part from last week, no worries. Go back to it after you finish this one. By the end of our conversation, you'll also discover what makes Chardonnay more of a survivor grape compared to other varieties, what are Teresa's favorite wine gadgets, why are so many people afraid to talk about négociant winemaking and négociant producers, and what exactly is that, what flavors and aromas are imparted by including ripened stems in the fermentation process, How many different types of soil are found in Sonoma County? Tip, it's more than all of France combined. And how did this staggering diversity develop? How do microclimates differ across the wine neighborhoods of the Russian River Valley? And what is their influence on the wine's characteristics? How has being a gay woman impacted Teresa's experience in the wine industry? What can wineries do to be more inclusive toward the LGBTQ plus community? Which aspects of making Russian River Selection Pinot Noir are Teresa's favorites? What do Gary Farrell wines, Pinot Noir, and Sanford and Benedict Pinot Noir taste like, and how do they differ? Which foods would pair best with these wines, and why? And if Teresa could share a bottle of wine with anyone in the world, who would she choose, and why? Just a reminder that one of you is going to win a gorgeous bottle of Gary Farrell wines Pinot Noir from the Russian River Valley. All you have to do is email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com and let me know that you would like to win a bottle. I will pick one person randomly from those who contact me. Okay, let's dive in. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people? hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 299. In personal news, I want to share with you a review for the new audiobook of Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Defamation, and Drinking Too Much. It's by Jim Beeson from Magnolia, Texas, just outside of Houston, and he posted it on audible.com. Inspiring. Great story, well-read, well-written. Unfortunate that Natalie had to endure her worst vintage, yet I loved how she persevered through it. And I applaud the way she told the story, turning a huge negative into an incredibly positive message. And I love the fact that she narrated her own memoir. What other choice could be made? Great work all round. Five stars. Thank you so much, Jim. You can download Wine Witch on Fire and start listening to it immediately on audible.com. Kobo, Audiobooks.com, Spotify, Google Play, Libro FM, and wherever else you get audiobooks. If you've started listening to the audiobook, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to all retailers worldwide for the audiobook, ebook, and paperback versions at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 299. Okay, on with the show. So the winery produces about 30 cases of wine a year, 60% sold in restaurants. We're fortunate in Canada to get a small number of those cases sold through retail outlets, mostly through the LCBO's Vintages Release Program. But I'm curious, you work with about 35 to 40 different vineyards to produce your seven vineyard-designated Chardonnays, 14 vineyard-designated Pinot Noirs each year, as well as a blend of grapes from various vineyards under your labels, the Russian River Valley Chardonnay Pinot, which we're going to taste. 
It's very similar, I think, to the Burgundian model of being a négociant who purchases grapes from a lot of growers and then makes the wine rather than the Bordeaux model of a large estate owning their own grapes. How does making vineyard designated wines differ from those that depart from the obvious, you know, you've got multiple components in a blend? Right. No, thank you for talking about the négociant model. A lot of people are afraid to talk about negociant winemaking, negociant producers, because they think about buying bulk wine and making cheap wines out of it. Oh, I think of Louis Jadot, like the top houses in Burgundy. That's yeah, what they do. They're absolutely. buying. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of negociant producers like that who are Grand Cru and Premier Cru producers in Burgundy. Some of the best wines I ever had were from negociant producers. So they're buying grapes from, you know, Grand Cru and Premier Cru vineyards and making wine from them rather than owning their own vineyards. And so it's a similar model at Gary Farrell Winery. And what's really fun and special about making vineyard designated wines, we make the blends as well, but I love both. I love the blending process of putting together this Russian River Selection Pinot that you have. But I also love making each of the individual vineyard designated wines because they all have such really tremendously unique characteristics to them. Some of them are dark fruit, you know, the cool climate stuff, you know, like Hallberg and McDonald Mountain. They've just got this really beautiful blue, red, and purple fruit qualities to them and bigger, you know, deeper tannins versus in where Rocchioli and Bacigalupi are located a little bit more inland in this neighborhood that's called the Middle Reach. It's a warmer climate. Acid is there. It's a defining characteristic, but it's not quite as prominent as from those cooler climates. And so it's just fun, you know, to play around with different percentages of whole cluster from the cooler climates. You can do a lot more whole cluster inclusion from cool climates than you can in warm climates because fruit ripens ahead of the stems. The stems, you know, need a little bit more time. And so in cooler climates, you get more extended hang time. And you can do, I've done as much as 100% whole cluster from Green Valley. So let me see if I understand. Is it the stems that ripen before the grapes? The grapes ripen ahead of the stems, especially in warmer climates. Mm -hmm. Oh, in warmer climates. But in your area, what's ripening first? The grapes themselves are generally going to ripen ahead of the stems. And so you kind of want, in cooler climates, your fruit is getting an extended hang time. And the more time you have for your fruit to ripen, the greater chance you're going to have of stem lignification or stem ripening as well. So if you're lucky, you get some ripening of the stems where you can use it in the fermentation and get some really beautiful spice characteristics, savory aromas and flavors, black tea, and also you get some tannin in the wine as well from stem inclusion. And the stems have a lot of potassium, so they also can have a natural deacidification process as well. Oh, really? So it's potassium that deacidifies wine. Mm -hmm. It must... (laughs) Let me not try chemistry, but glom on to the wine and drop it out? Or exactly. So it's okay. about potassium and acid molecules interacting with one another, reacting, and then it just kind of drops out of the fermentation. Okay. Mercifully untechnical. Thank you. Technical. <laughs> I tried. <Boy>. I tried. <laughs> Without <laughs> writing another dissertation. <laughs> so the fact that you've got this negotiant model Is that a greater risk for you? Like you don't own the vineyard is what I mean. Or is it the fact that, do you mitigate that because you've got such long-term contracts, it all nets out? Yes, the latter. I actually feel like it's beneficial not to own the vineyard because there's just less risk involved, you know, and we have certain parameters listed in our grape contracts that would allow us to opt out of the contract if we needed to. Granted, we've never had to, except in 2020, when we mutually agreed with the growers that we weren't going to take the grapes because of, you know, smoke exposure. But, you know, if we owned the vineyards, we would be assuming the cost of those grapes if we weren't making wine out of them in years like 2020. Right. Okay. That totally makes sense. Now, you've mentioned that Sonoma has more soil types than all of France, I believe. How many soil types does Sonoma have, roughly, like approximately? Yeah, gosh, like 31 different soil series. It's over 30 different soil series. Is there a difference between a soil series and a soil type? It's the same thing. You know, like Gold Ridge series soil is, you know, it's the series of the soil type, but the type is sandy loam, if that makes sense to you. Okay, yeah. And YOLO series is more clay-based, a clay type of soil. And so... What happened? Was it some tectonic shift or something glacial? What created so many soil types in Sonoma? 
A lot of stuff. There's been a lot of geological activity over millions of years, and there's been, you know, volcanic activity and, you know, moving of the coastal tectonic plates, both of which created the Mayakamas Mountains that are east of us between Napa and Sonoma. Also flooding of the plains and the recession of the ocean floor. So Russian River Valley used to be part of the ocean floor, kind of a shallow ocean. Green Valley specifically was like a shallow ocean. Okay. So is there lots of limestone from fossil ocean creatures? Or? There's limestone, not as much as you get in Burgundy. There's a lot of sandstone. And so, you know, Goldridge series sandy loam soil has a lot of that in it. It's really cool to, I've got this really great image of a soil pit that they dug at the Hallberg Vineyard. It's one of our main vineyards. It's in Green Valley, so pretty close to the ocean. And, you know, they dug a soil pit down to below the root level of the grapevines and adjacent to a row of vines so you could see where the roots are. And about 18 inches down, it was probably, you know, between 18 and 24 inches down was you could see the Goldridge series fine powdery sandy loam soil on the top. That's called the topsoil. And then down below that is what they call Sebastopol series, which is more of a iron rich kind of orange colored, a little bit more clay type of soil. It's clay and sand together. But it's just fascinating to see that. That's also a testament to the vast geological activity that's happened over millions of years. Yeah. I love those kinds of pictures where you see all the different layers. You also talk about wine neighborhoods. You were getting at that with the middle reach and so on each one having a different, I love that your term though, wine neighborhoods, having different microclimates and soil types. So just to go back to that for a minute, the middle reach, that would be the warmest one? The middle reach is now the second warmest. So we've added a sixth neighborhood to the neighborhoods discussion. And so the Eastern Hills, which are the vineyards that are east of Highway 101. So on the north end of the Russian River Valley and east of Highway 101. So talking Chalk Hill, and it's really warm out there. You don't get much of the fog influence there as well. But the Middle Reach is the northernmost part of the Russian River Valley. A lot of the vineyards run along the river, as I discussed when I mentioned Rokioli and Bacigalupi. I talked about the significance of the fog and the type of soil there next to the river. But you also have vineyards that are a little bit on slightly higher elevation, and you don't get as much of the fog influence in those because they're not right next to the river. So you could almost split the middle reach into two. You could talk about the vineyards that are adjacent to the river, and you can talk about the ones that are on a hillside. And the ones on the hillside are, you know, more robust, richer, riper, and they have much more of a tannic structure to them. Whereas like Bacigalupi and Rocchioli, the fruit that I work with at Gary Farrell, those wines tend to be more kind of succulent red fruit, lush, soft tannins. Acidity is present, but just in the perfect amount, not as high as Green Valley. So it's, it's a really neat neighborhood to talk about. Yeah. And you do a little bit of Zinfandel, you said. Would the Zinfandel be in one of those warmer neighborhoods? So we worked with two Zinfandel vineyards during my time at Gary Farrell. And the one in Dry Creek I already told you about, which is not in Russian River. The other vineyard that we worked with was called Maffei. It is called Maffei. It's still there. <laughs> we just don't make it anymore. It's in a neighborhood that's warmer. Yep. It's here, not very far from my house, in a neighborhood that's called the Santa Rosa Plains. And it's called the Plains because it's a flatter area, makes a totally different type of Zinfandel than Dry Creek because of the neighborhood. It's a low-lying area, cold air settles at night, vines retain lots of natural acidity, and the Zinfandel is not going to be as big and rich and ripe as a Dry Creek Zinfandel. Hmm. That's great. Well, okay, so let's just see before I want to get to this tasting, of course. Why do you call Chardonnay a survivor beyond the effect uh, on, we know that it can adapt to many regions, but what is it about Chardonnay that's a survivor for you? Yeah, Chardonnay is just, they're just really robust clusters and berries. And I find that, you know, with really big swings and, you know, temperature fluctuations, lots of fog, Pinot Noir is just really susceptible to all kinds of influences microbial, big drastic weather changes, which I told you about in 2010, for example. Chardonnay is impacted as well, but it doesn't really raisin up like Pinot Noir does. Both are thin-skinned, cool climate varietals, but Chardonnay is just really robust and tends to hang on during temperature swings like that. And it's not as susceptible to as many of the microbial issues as Pinot Noir. It is susceptible to things like Botrytis, which is a mold that develops in the vineyard. But when you make Chardonnay, for the most part, most producers are 
putting the clusters into a press and squeezing the juice out and throwing the solids away. And so you don't have, you know, the skins and any damage to the skins to deal with. Okay. Well, changing track just before we get to the tasting, you know, despite some progress, only 14% of lead winemakers in California are women. Fewer than 10% of wineries are owned by women. It was the case not just for California, but many other wine regions. Why do you think the stats haven't changed materially over the last, say, five to 10 years? Yeah, that's a really tough one to answer. Yeah, I scratch my head about that all the time. It was about 10% when I got into the wine industry. And if it's only 14 or 15% today, that's really a small change over the 22 or 23 years that I've been in the industry. So why? I can only surmise that a lot of women are maybe still deterred by the fact that there are so many men and they think it's, you know, manly work. <laughs> I don't know. But also, I feel like wineries should make it a little bit more inviting for women. And we try at Gary Farrell. Our winemaker, who is in charge of hiring the harvest interns, makes it a point to try it, try and hire half and half female versus male interns. He also tries to get a really good mix of you know people from different parts of the world. Excellent. And what advice do you give to young intern women, men too? What advice do you give that might surprise us? Well, to young women, my biggest piece of advice to them is just to be themselves. You know, don't try to be one of the guys. Part of the problem is feeling intimidated by the fact that you're surrounded by so many men and doing this really hard physical work. Women can be as good, if not better than, you know, the men at what they do. And so they just need to feel comfortable being themselves and being a woman. Sure. That's good advice. Do you give any advice to the young male interns or just like watch out? <laughs> yeah, just, you know, <laughs> don't be cocky. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. Got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, you were named Innovator of the Year by the Sonoma County Vintners Association last year, in part for your efforts related to diversity, equality, and inclusion in the wine industry. You were also honored with the North Bay Business Journal's Pride Leadership Award, which recognizes local professionals for their contributions to the Pride movement, including your work at the Human Rights Campaign. How has being a gay woman impacted your own experience in the wine industry? Yeah. I think the way it's impacted me most is it's taught me how to be an advocate. I've been very outspoken since the very beginning, since I first came out. And I came out when I was working at Joseph Phelps Vineyards, probably within a year or around, you know, I had been there for about a year. And since was then, that I've difficult? Just, yeah, I mean, my brother was gay and he's my only other sibling. And so he came out when he was in early college as well. We're only about 17 months apart. So he kind of paved the way for me and I had a lot of, you know, LGBTQ community surrounding me my whole life. And I think I was just prepared for it, but it was hard to figure out how to tell people, especially because I had been straight my whole adult life, or at least I thought I was. So, you know, I came out to them and once I did, I was like, Whew, now it's easy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> doing yeah. it, you know, like right. ripping off the Band-Aid and doing it. So since then, I've realized that it's a lot easier to just be myself, you know, right. just to be out and proud. And so I am. And I love it. Good for you. Wow. What has changed for the better for the LGBTQ plus community, say, in the last five years in the wine industry? The last five years, I haven't seen a huge amount of change. But in the past 10 years, there's been an evolution. I feel like more people are out Media is writing about the queer community. You read about it in newspapers and, you know, you see videos, postings on social media all the time. And so the more people hear about it and see us, the more they know we're here and that we're significant and sort of normalizes things a lot more. Absolutely. And what still needs to be done, in your opinion? I mean, I think a lot of wineries need to just make it feel safe for the LGBTQ community by doing things like using the safe space symbol on your website or putting, you know, signage up on the door, something about equality or putting a safe space symbol out on the front door of your winery as well. Just making us feel safe and included. Yeah, that doesn't seem like such a big step. And yet it's so important. Yeah. And Gary Farrell Winery became an early supporter and member of the LGBTQ Wine Society, which brings together, as I understand, wine lovers, wineries, restaurants, hotels, retailers in Sonoma County. And member Gary Saperstein, 
who owns Out in the Vineyard, which is such a clever name and organization, organizes Gay Wine Weekend with exclusive events and special events for the community. Under his leadership, the group has also produced a map of more than 425 wineries in Sonoma that are gay friendly. Yes. Clapping. Yes. Is there anything else that comes to mind in terms of inclusion that wineries could focus on? Hosting events would be amazing. You know, hosting events during Pride Month or featuring a special Pride wine. Like Iron Horse has the Rainbow Cuvée. And it just makes, even though they don't necessarily have a gay winemaker or, you know, LGBTQ plus owner, they just support the community. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone is planning a trip to Sonoma, what are your best two tips on visiting the region itself? Let's see. What would I say? I mean, you have to eat some of the food. We have some really amazing restaurants here in Sonoma County, but if you were going to book a couple of tastings. Well, actually, tip number one is don't book too many tastings. Don't try to go to too many places. Sit and enjoy. Book two or three in a day, and I wouldn't actually do more than two. And I would try to book them in. Choose one that's, you know, a well-known, a big-known winery if that's your thing. But I would say pick one that's off the beaten path as well and really just try to, you know, explore the different off the beaten path areas of Sonoma County. And what about when they visit Gary Farrell Winery? What are your best tips there to get the most from their visit? Yeah. Well, tip number one would be book the last appointment of the day if you can, because you're not going to want to leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't want to feel rushed. And what else would I say? If the weather is nice enough, I'd say sit out on the terrace and enjoy that view that I told you about earlier. Absolutely. And don't assume the woman petting the cat is there to take your coat. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but I'm okay. I'm also okay when people don't know that it's me. I don't, I'm not the kind of winemaker who has the ego and needs to be recognized all the time. Sometimes I just want to sit out there and just be a regular old, you know, person hanging out on the terrace. I hear you. <laughs> all right, let's taste. I've been waiting to get to this, looking forward to it. So I'm very fortunate that I have your Russian River Pinot Noir here. Do you have it as well there? I know. I have two fun vineyard designated pinots. Oh, great. Good. So we'll have a, a broader swath to talk about. So maybe you can, like we've talked about this, it's a blend, I assume, of different vineyards from the Russian River, just as you do one Chardonnay like this. Maybe tell us a bit about this in terms of whatever you want to tell us about the background or how it smells and tastes to you as the winemaker, food pairings, whatever you like. Oh, yeah. So blending that wine is one of my favorite parts of my job. So it's comprised of about, let's say, 25, 24, 23 different vineyards. So it's fun to do the blending sessions when we're putting those wines together because we're sitting down and doing blind tastings and figuring out which vineyard designated components are the ones that are the best for the Russian River Selection blend. Now, keep in mind that, you know, if we're working with 30 or 40 different vineyards, that's all of our Pinot and Chardonnay, we're working with, you know, 20 some odd different Pinot vineyards, and each of them is a component of the Russian River Selection blend. And so, you know, it's like cooking in many ways, you know, putting something that's darker fruit and something that's more red fruit that's lush and soft on the palate. But another component might have really bright acidity and another one might have really big, robust tannins. And it takes a little bit of each one to make the Russian River Selection blend perfect. And that's why it's so much fun to put it together. It's beautiful. I mean, it's just so balanced. It's not too much of anything. and It's definitely your orchestra versus your soloist. It <laughs> is definitely an orchestra. I love the musical analogy. And I didn't notice, which vintage do you have there? Is it 19 or 21? Uh, let me check the label. It is 21. Okay. Yep. And it's just gorgeous. I mean, oh my goodness, everything you were talking about in there. It's like liquid silk as well. So Yeah, and 21 was a great vintage. It was, you know, a nice, long, extended hang time kind of growing season. And so the grapes got to develop lots of, you know, really nice tannins, really resolved tannins. Oh, so it's got wow. great structure and concentration. Yes, this wine has resolved all of its issues. There's nothing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's this cool. Needs therapy for. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So tell us about the two wines you have. Please. So the two that I have are, can you see this? Okay. Yes, I can. And we'll put a link in the show notes to, okay. to these so wines as well. This is our um, Hallberg Vineyard Pinot Noir, and this is a 2017 vintage. Okay. And so I was already talking about this vineyard when I was talking about the neighborhoods of the Russian River Valley. So this one is located in Green Valley, which is 
incidentally, a sub appellation of the Russian River Valley close to the ocean. And so, you know, very foggy. And that Green Valley AVA was established the same year that the Russian River Valley was established in 1983. So is it a cooler climate then? Definitely a cooler climate. I find that the Hallberg Pinots tend to have a little bit more blue and purple fruit associated with them and more blue and purple flowers as well. Whereas something like Rocchioli or Bacigalupi would have, you know, more rose petal floral aromas and more like vibrant cherry and raspberry red fruits. So Hallberg has a lot of red fruit as well, but I feel like it's really mixed in with a lot of those blue and purple fruits. And would your food pairings differ between the two wines you have there and the one that I have? Yes. The other wine that I have here, actually, I should mention, is our 2017 Sanford and Benedict Vineyard Pinot Noir, which I thought would be fun to talk about because it's in a completely different climate. So we're outside of the Russian River Valley now. This is about five hours away um, south of here in the city of Lompoc. And it's just south of San Luis Obispo, which is where I went to college. Thank you for mentioning that. In a beautiful area, also a very, very cool climate, but totally different soil type, different growing conditions as well. So the wines are very different from Hallberg, which I told you is a little bit more blue flowers. Sanford and Benedict is more earthy, bigger tannins, for sure bigger tannins, and a little bit more red fruit forward. So it's fun to evaluate them side by side. Food pairings wise, with your Russian River Selection Pinot, one of my absolute favorite pairings is either a banh mi or what are the Asian sandwiches that are in the soft, sticky bun. I'm drawing a blank on that today, but let's just talk about the banh mi, which is a Vietnamese sandwich. So generally it has some sort of, you know, sliced meat inside, usually some grilled sliced meat and fresh herbs. So usually like some fresh mint and or cilantro and basil. And I often put hoisin in it as well. So it's just really fresh and clean and crisp, but still has, you know, the meat usually has some Asian five spice in it. So it's got that deliciousness to it. Oh, that would be wonderful. Wow. Making me hungry. It's almost dinner time here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Asian foods pair really well with our wines and with your Russian River Selection Pinot in particular. Absolutely. And is there anything else you'd suggest, especially with the two that you have there? Yeah. So with the Hallberg, let's see, what would I have with, I mean, Thinking about kind of classic, more Eurocentric food pairings, I always love duck with the Hallberg Pinot, especially, you know, like some sort of a blueberry or a black cherry reduction sauce. I think it's just absolutely delicious. But, you know, Sanford and Benedict, because it has a little bit more red fruit forward qualities to it, I might even pair some sort of Asian dish with it, like a salt and pepper shrimp. Yeah. Or something with a bigger, richer sauce to it as well. We did a wine dinner at a Chinese restaurant in Miami one year, and it just blew my mind that the types of pairings that she could do with these wines, with the Pinots and the Chardonnays, because of that beautiful, you know, mouthwatering acidity. And they're not over-extracted, and they're not over-ripe, and they're not over-oaked, so everything's in balance. This is lovely. Absolutely. And you mentioned the Eurocentric. I want to ask you about that. Why do you think some of those traditional Eurocentric pairings, red wine, red meat, white wine, white Meat yeah, are outdated. I mean, you're talking about it. You kind of already answered my question with all of these new spicy Asian pairings and so on. But is there anything more you want to say about that? Absolutely. So just in the name, the Eurocentric pairings, it really is very insensitive to cultural and socioeconomic differences, right? I kind of try to think about it like an IQ test. You know, IQ tests were made for people of a certain socioeconomic status and cultural background. So there are a lot of wine consumers from all different parts of the world. They don't all come from Europe. And so we have to try to turn that, flip a switch in our brains to try and think of different descriptors and different food pairings that are more, you know, relevant to people from different cultural backgrounds. I love that. I've never heard anyone describe it like that, Teresa. And just the wines as well. Not everybody is drinking Bordeaux and Burgundy every night unless you have a trust fund. So that's kind of Eurocentric thinking too in the actual wines themselves, you know, especially when you have wines like yours available for those pairings. I mean, let's face it, all of our wines originated in Europe. So, you know, we have to give credence to that. Sure. And you also pair your wines, if I understand correctly, at the terrace tasting room with artisanal cheeses. So which cheeses do you suggest would go with the Pinots and also with the Chardonnays? Yeah. I mean, they have their specific cheeses that they put on the cheese plate. I don't remember all of them specifically, but with the Chardonnays, 
They serve a Marin French is the producer and the soft cheese is called Petite Breakfast. And it doesn't have any, if you've had brie, brie can have this kind of gamey animal like quality to it, especially if you're eating the rind. But the Petite Breakfast is just creamy and mild and soft like a brie with a little bit more firm texture to it. But it pairs beautifully with the Chardonnays because it doesn't dominate any of the Chardonnay flavor characteristics. Gouda is like a soft Gouda is also really amazingly like a Comte is really delicious with our Chardonnays. With the Pinot, I would go as far as like a really aged cheddar or an aged Gouda where you've even got some of the crystally bits in there. Have you had one of those before? Oh, I love those little crunchy bits. Some of my favorite amino acids or something, are they? (laughs) Back to chemistry again. (laughs) Yeah, actually, I should really know that. I would think that it's, you know, like salts and maybe amino acids as well. I'm going to look into that now. Thank you. There's some little clusters or something, but yeah, I love them. The little crunchy bits. Yeah, Yeah. maybe it's even (laughs) You know, like in wine, the tartrates are what precipitate out into the bottom when you're, you know, deacidifying a wine or when wine naturally deacidifies and ages and tannins and tartrates drop out. I wonder if those are similar to little tartrate crystals. I wonder if it's something like that. Anyway, who knows? It really does all come back to chemistry. Oh, my goodness. It (laughs) does. Chemistry explains everything in the world. Everything. It does. It does. I love this conversation. I don't want to squeeze in a few more questions, but I am cognizant of the time. Let's see. Is there a favorite childhood food you had and what might you pair with it as an adult today? Ooh, what were one of my favorite? Oh gosh, I'm so not a food driven person. Like one of my cats, my young cat. I mean, look, I've always loved chicken (laughs) and I've always loved the drippings in the pan. My wife will make fun of me because, you know, as soon as we're done with a meal, I'll eat a modest meal and then I'm cleaning up. I'm the cleanup crew. She's the cook and I'm the cleanup crew. So, you know, I'm always going to want to scrape the little bits off the bottom of the pan. And I feel like that in itself could pair with something that could be a delicious pairing. I love that drippings. Like that's where all the flavor is. That's how you season a pan. So that's where the good stuff is. You got little (laughs) bits of, you know, meat and little bits of the sauce that's left or the seasonings from whatever your chicken was cooked in. So Man, I would pair that with our Hallberg Pinot, since I have it right here. Yeah, actually, I should be tasting a little bit of this wine. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's see. But, uh, do you have any useful wine gadgets you've come across that you'd recommend? Oh, yeah. I mean, may I mention a few? Would that be okay? Yes, yes absolutely. So my absolute favorite one that I think is kind of a life changer for anybody who drinks older wines is the Durand wine opener. Oh. Have you heard of this? Is it the two prongs? That it go has on two prongs. Side of a dried out cork, yeah. Yeah, so it has those two prongs. That's an osso. But the Durand has the worm corkscrew as well. And so it's a genius device. I don't own one. They're about $150. And I haven't purchased one yet, but I need to. KNL Wines in South San Francisco has it for $125 right now. So I think I'm going to grab one. But it's really a life changer if you're pulling the cork out of an old bottle, because as you know, corks age over time and they start to kind of break down and it can be really hard and impossible to remove an old cork from a bottle. If you have the Durand, you put the cork screw in first, get it all the way in there, snug up against the cork, and then you just put the two prongs of the osso part of it down in it. And then you pull it out like you would using an osso, but the corkscrew itself acts as an anchor. So it's a really necessary device for people who drink older vintage wines. Yeah, great design. And then another of my favorite things that I believe it or not, I very rarely use is this guy. This is a little bottle closure. It's called Repour. Repour. I really should get some in the house, but it's intended to use, as you can see, I don't know if you can see here, but there's this little hole in the bottom there. There's a little sachet of some sort of chemical inside there that acts as oxygen scavenger or kind of a desiccant, so to speak. And so when you get it, it has a little foil cover over the hole and you just take it off. You can put it in your bottle, you know, screw it in there really good. And if you're not going to drink the wine for a few days, if you leave it closed up, it actually pulls oxygen out of the air in the bottle and helps it to age. And, you know, Report's website also says that it kind of like pulls oxygen out of the wine as well. So if you want to read more about chemistry, look at the Repor website because they explain the chemical laws behind it. Yay, so pretty cool chemistry. stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Those are great. Any others? Or I didn't want to cut you off if you had more gadgets you wanted oh, to Oh, no, mention. that's okay. <laughs> okay. My other favorite gadget is this scary one right here. 
Oh, a saber. This is a right? saber. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's lethal. It's, it's not really, it's often? not, it's not sharp at all. It's just an iron horse saber, actually. Okay. So I can rub this, you know, it's not sharp at all. It's just intended to use, you use the other side to, right. you know, remove the top of a champagne bottle when it's, right. it's under so much true. pressure. Yeah, that's great. So if you could share a bottle of wine with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would that be? And why would you open? What would you ask them? Oh boy. Anyone in the world, huh? Yep. I'm going to go with, it's two people. I can't separate them. I've always, always, always wanted to sit and break bread with the Obamas. Oh, that'd be fabulous. If I could, I want to sit down and I would drink any bottle of wine with them, but boy, it would be the most amazing thing in the world to drink a wine that I've never had, which is a Latache from Romani Conti in Burgundy, one of the most historical and famous vineyards in all of the world. Absolutely. And I just want to hear them talk and they're so intelligent, both of them. I would love to just, you know, hear more from them and just listen, just be the fly on the wall. Absolutely. I can't imagine what dinner is like with them just on a regular Tuesday night. (laughs) So much fun, right? I imagine it would be a lot of fun. Absolutely. All right. We have just run the course here. It's just so amazing. And I haven't gotten to everything. Is there anything that we haven't covered, Teresa, that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? No, we've covered a lot. I think your questions are all, you know, digging deep. This is one of the most deep dive podcasts I've ever done. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. I mean, the stories and tips are just amazing. I love the breadth and depth of your experience. Where can people find you and Gary Farrell Wines online? Yeah. So actually, that is something that I failed to mention is that in May, I actually started my own business called Heredia Wine Consulting. And I've transitioned full time out of Gary Farrell Winery, and I'm their consulting winemaker. So Brett McCoy, who's been at Gary Farrell for 19 years and actually worked with Gary Farrell, the man, he's now stepped up as head winemaker. And so I'm offering some advice through this harvest and I'm looking and picking up clients myself. So to find me, you go to my website, which is www.herwineco.com. It's the first three letters of my last name, and it's just a cool website, Her Wine Co. How cool is that? I can't that believe great. it was available. That worked out. <laughs> yeah, it really did. Yeah. And same on Instagram. It's her underscore wine co. We'll put those links in the show notes as well. Great. Thank you. And Gary Farrell Winery, check out the website. You can see some beautiful pictures of the terrace as well. And that's just www.garyfarrellwinery.com. And if you want to go taste there, you have to book an appointment. So I'd suggest booking at least a week or two in advance, if not more. Good to know. This is great. I will raise my glass to you and say thank you so much. I hope next time we can do this in person. Cheers. Yes, cheers to you. Great to get to know you and to taste your wines. Amazing. Really amazing. But here's to the next time. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Teresa. Here are my takeaways. Why should you look beyond Eurocentric wine and food pairings? As Teresa explains, it's in the name. Eurocentric pairings don't include cultural and socioeconomic differences. She thinks about them like IQ tests in that they were made for people of certain socioeconomic status and cultural background. However, there are a lot of wine consumers from all different parts of the world. We don't all come from Europe. So we have to flip a switch in our brains to think of different descriptors and different food pairings that are more relevant to people from different cultural backgrounds. And frankly, personally, I find it far more interesting. I love actually finding new wine pairings for the different cuisines that we enjoy, from Indian and Thai to a whole range of East Asian and other types of dishes. Number two, what's so special about making vineyard-designated wines? Teresa loves making vineyard-designated wines because they each have unique characteristics. Some of them produce dark fruit, like Coburg and McDonald Mountain, They have this really beautiful blue, red, purple fruit qualities to them, she says, and the deeper tannins versus an inland vineyard that's called Middle Reach. It's a warmer climate. The the acidity is still there and it's still a defining characteristic, but it's not quite as prominent as those from cooler climates. And number three, how can you get the most out of your next trip to Sonoma County? 
Teresa advises getting out to Sonoma County restaurants because the food is amazing, and of course the pairings would be as well. She also says to avoid booking too many tastings, perhaps just two or three a day. Choose one that's a well-known winery and maybe one that's off the beaten path. In the show notes, you'll find the full transcript of my conversation with Teresa, links to her website and wines, the video versions of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live, and where you can order my book online now, no matter where you live. You can also find a link to take a free online food and wine pairing class with me called The Five Wine and Food Pairing Mistakes That Can Ruin Your Dinner and How to Fix Them Forever at nataliemclean.com forward slash class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 299. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or if you've read my book or are listening to it at natalie at nataliemclean.com. If you've missed episode 182, go back and take a listen. I chat about California's Paso Robles wine region and high acidity wines with Lori Budd. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Wines have acidity. Even red wines have acidity to them, but tannins calm it down. In a white wine, when the acid is high, you take a sip and your tongue starts to salivate, kind of like if you suck on a lemon that makes you crave another drink. Just as you squeeze lemon on a fish because it adds that mouthwatering acidity and makes the food taste better, I think the acidity also brings forward the flavor in the wine and makes it even taste better. Acid is our friend. (laughs) Yes, there's a balance. You won't want to miss next week when we chat with Edward Slingerlin, a professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia and author of the bestseller, Drunk, How We Sipped, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization, which examines how our taste for intoxicants was not an evolutionary accident He argues instead that wine, alcohol, and other drugs have played a crucial role in helping humans to be more creative, trusting, and cooperative. If you liked this episode or even learned one thing from it, please email or tell a friend about the podcast this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in learning more about the wines of Sonoma and especially the Russian River. It's easy to find my podcast. Just tell them to search for Natalie McLean Wine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, their favorite podcast app, or they can listen to the show on my website at nataliemclean.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a voluptuous Sonoma Chardonnay. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.